Today, we are creating a digital painting in the style of Diego Velázquez. Our goal is to combine the authenticity of old-school traditional painting techniques with the power of 3D rendering in digital painting. I'll be breaking down my entire process from start to finish so that you can follow along. We'll start by posing a photorealistic model with MetaHumans in Unreal Engine, then we'll dress him up using Marvel Designer, and finally, we'll give the image a flavor of Velázquez's painting style using Photoshop. First off, let's find a model willing to be painted. MetaHumans, which is free to access with Unreal Engine, is a very natural choice. You see, to really capture the fine facial expressions and the intensity of the stare of a human face, you need a highly detailed character model. Starting from one of the presets, I try to create someone that Velázquez could have met in Spain at the time. I'm shooting for a middle-aged guy, probably in his 50s, with some sort of a latent look. I can age his face a bit, customize his hairstyle, tweak his skin tone and texture, and grow him a fancy mustache. Now, I can even preview his facial expressions to see how convincing he would be as a model. Yeah, he does not seem to be excited for this job, but he will do. Now, Velázquez needs a workshop. Let's create a blank Unreal Engine project and using the built-in Quixel Bridge window, import our human model. The first thing we want to do is create a new sequence in which we can add our model to animate him and give him his final pose. I'm trying to get him seated an angle from the painter's position, somewhere around 40 to 45 degrees, and let's make sure that he's looking at us. With the fine facial control rig, I can control the hundreds of muscles on his face to give him something of an interesting expression. A serious stare, but with a hint of amusement. And we now need to create a camera to capture the point of view of the painter. But here is our first challenge, choosing our camera settings to match how a painter will see his model. If you look through thousands of photo portraits, you will quickly realize that some faces appear wider, flatter, more distorted depending on the camera lens that was used to capture the photo. But if you do the same exercise with painted portraits, all human models appear natural, undistorted, much like real humans in real life. This is because every portrait ever painted was captured with the exact same camera lens, the human eye. So how can we set up our Unreal Engine camera to get as close as possible to human vision? Should we stick to a 50mm focal lens like most people seem to say on the internet? Well, it's not exactly a straightforward answer, and let me explain why. This is your entire field of view, close to 200 degrees across. To cover that on a full-frame camera, you will need some of the most expensive 6mm fisheye lenses on the planet. But you really only see at maximum sharpness and accuracy in a tiny portion about 2 degrees wide. You see, when you look at something, as your eyes twitch and glance over the whole object, they feed your brain with up-to-date, sharp information about small parts of it. What you think your vision is, is actually more of a mental reconstruction from your brain. So, to fill a full-frame camera with what we consider to be good, accurate human vision, you will need a 1000mm lens. Anything further from this area gets exponentially blurrier and colorless. Above 20 degrees of field of view, or roughly the area covered by a 100mm telephoto lens, words are now too blurry to be read at all. With a 43mm lens, you reach the limits after which you can't recognize any symbols anymore. And with a 31mm lens, you reach the limits of color perception. Anything after is so blurry and low res that it mostly gives information about brightness and anything else is mostly filled by your brain. And with a 10mm lens, you cover the area of your binocular vision. So, because all of these focal lengths are all valid answers, we need to approach a problem from another angle. I'm going to position my camera at the distance I would guess a painter would stand from his model, probably a few meters back. And now, I'm going to change the focal lengths of my camera to fill the model in my frame. And you might ask, wait, you're randomly changing the focal lens. You lose control over the deformation of the face. It might look unnatural. Well, no. You see, wide-angle deformations are not caused by short focal lens. They are caused by the photographer physically moving closer to the model to fill the frame. So, as long as the camera does not move, it doesn't matter how much I change my focal lens, the deformation of the face remains exactly the same. Now, to make our set more realistic, I'm making a quick and dirty interior with basic shapes and a texture from the Quixel library. I then place some light sources around my model, which I try to tweak the color of to mimic warm candlelight. Velázquez was a painter who incorporated chiaroscuro into his work, much like other naturalists and baroque painters. 
The idea is to have one main strong light source. At the time, this lighting setup was nothing more than a nice trick to accentuate volumes and make flat paintings appear less flat thanks to gradients of light and darkness curving around the shapes. For the clothing, I tried looking for references from the 17th century. Looking at how models in Velázquez's painting were clothed, I think I'll go for something relatively simple, like a shirt and a fancy jacket on top. So, in Marvel's Designer, I start by importing a shirt preset, which I modify a bit to give more character. On top of that, I'm creating a basic jacket with a line of small buttons on the top part. Adding some details, I start creating a collar, which I position around his neck, and finally create his padding patterns on the front. I'm doing the actual texturing in Blender. I start with a tile close texture, that will be my basis. I then break up the repetition using some random noises. Now I can bake the final result into one single albedo texture map, which can be easily imported with my clothes in Unreal Engine. In Unreal, all I need to do now is to match the position and rotation of my clothes with those of my model. With some minor additional tweaks done, like cranking up our ray tracing settings, we are now ready to render an image. In the sequencer, I limit my timeline to one single frame, and then open the sequence up in the movie render queue. Let's have a look at the render settings. JPEG is a compressed format with a low bit depth, meaning less precision colors and values. I'm going to export mine in EXR format instead to get the highest dynamic range and color accuracy. I will also activate the anti-aliasing and higher resolution options. In the output, all I need to do now is to select an output folder and make sure that my render resolution matches the dimensions of my camera. And we are ready to render! Ok, time to turn this render into an actual painting. Let me segment the main steps for you, but obviously this process is more iterative and flexible than what I will show. Do give yourself the freedom to go back and forth between the steps. Before all, let's drag in our EXR into Photoshop. I'm not sure if Photoshop can handle this format by default, so I'm using the EXR IO plugin. Because Photoshop has very limited tools for 32 bits images, let's reduce the bit depths down to 16 bits. Ok, our first step is to get correct levels and values. To make a first pass on the entire image, I'm going to open up the Camera Raw Viewer. In here, I'm trying to bring back a bit of warmth in the skin tones and add in a bit of contrast. But more importantly, I'm reducing the brightness of the blown out areas. Our eyes usually have wider dynamic ranges than digital cameras, so the painter will be perfectly able to see the subtle gradients in the highlights, in the color and the forehead. With these global adjustments done, let's move on to more local adjustments. My general workflow is to create an adjustment layer restricted to the part I'm interested in using a mask and eventually tweak the adjustment or the mask after. Make sure you keep a reference close by, I like to use pure ref for that. Let's make the head a bit darker. I'm making the main selection with the pen tool and then fine tune it with a softer brush. By the way, you can toggle on and off the mask layer by alt clicking on it. Let's make another adjustment on the clothing. I'm going to remove most of the blue color from it and brighten the shadows. Next up, I want to go into even smaller detail by manually painting highlights on the face. For that, I'll make a curves adjustment layer with a larger boost. Now make its mask completely black and brighten the mask with a soft brush and low opacity to gradually let the curves adjustment show in local areas. Now same operation with the shadows. And a final one to make the eyes more lively. Ok, the second main step is to push our colors closer to Velázquez's color palette. As a colorblind artist, I like to make my life as easy as possible. To get the ball rolling in the right direction, I will compile a few of his portraits in a new Photoshop file. After merging my layer stack into one single layer, I then ask Photoshop to map my colors to those in the portraits compilation. To refine them, I'm now sampling specific colors from those portraits, filling new layers with each of them, setting their blend modes to color, and then creating masks to restrict those to the part they should appear in. It's obviously not perfect, but it does help a lot in my case, and it will be very useful later on when we try to closely match his color palette. The next big improvement will be to add the brush strokes, but this will be done in several steps. Let's first focus on color blending. Ok, so one of the key elements of all paintings is that painters like to paint figuratively, meaning that they rely on shapes to convey detail. 
all these skin textures will probably not be visible in a Velasquez painting. And in fact, if we have a close look to references, skins are rendered smoothly no matter the age of the subject. Naturalist painters like to make the darker parts of their paintings less defiant and more blurry, because this is how human vision sees in low light. So I'm starting by creating a blurry version of my layer, and going into Layer Styles Fusion, I can restrict the blur layer to the darkest areas of our painting. I'll make another version of that, this time with low clarity and high noise reduction to soften the dark areas even more. And finally, to bring back detail in the lights, I'll make a version with higher clarity. The next step for the paintbrush aspect is to soften the volumes and high frequency detail of the surfaces. For this, I'm using this finger tool to nudge nearby colors together. By doing this, we are mimicking a painting technique used by Velázquez called a la prima. This is when the painter mixes layers of wet paint before they dry out. This allows to blend the colors and tones into soft gradients, making the subject more natural and lifelike. However, we need to pay close attention to our stroke direction. Try to take a step back and visualize your shape in three dimensions. Look closely at how light curves around volumes and fits the shape of the object. We need to stroke the brush in the direction of the light and volume. Otherwise, the transitions between light and shadows will look unnatural and your chiaroscuro aspect will break apart. Now onto the color area. And for the face, again, try to visualize how each muscle wraps around the skull, how light curves around, how shadows get trapped in crevices. With this done, we can add a final aggressive blur on parts of the clothing and the smoother areas of the face. References are your friends here, again. To get even closer to the a la prima feel of wet color blending, we're now switching to the brush mixer tool. This tool allows you to drag colors across the canvas like a real wet brush would do. You can decide how this blending behaves depending on the humidity and charge factors. This step is pretty important to accentuate the paint direction where the nudge tool was not able to make a sufficient job. With this heavy lifting done, we can now finalize our color work. Velasquez relied on a very limited color palette for his paintings. About 8 colors, mostly gradients of warm tones. I've included some blues, but these were extremely expensive pigments that will be scarcely used and we're not going to bother with them today. As of now, our colors are already pretty close, we've got some oranges, some yellows, reds, browns, blacks and whites. But what we're trying to do here is to turn our orange into Velasquez's specific orange, our red into his specific red, and so on. So here is my approach, and let's start with the red. I create a duplicate of my original layer. Using the color selection tool, I create a mask of the parts that are mostly red. And on that layer, I use the color replacement tool to turn my red into his red, using hex values to be accurate. And this layer will be set in color blend mode to limit its influence on color hues only. Now repeat the process for all 8 colors. And here's a before and after, it's a subtle but important difference. Now that our colors are correct, we can safely brush the canvas by sampling colors without risking of slipping out of Velasquez's color palette. So, depending on which areas I'm working on, I adapt my brush texture, the variation in rotation, size, step, etc. Always try to make subtle brush strokes by sampling nearby colors. This is where you can spend the most time. If you make a mistake, it's better to paint over rather than use the eraser tool. And remember, Velasquez likes to work figuratively. One precise thought-out stroke can suggest as much complexity as many smaller strokes. Look at the silver ornaments on this outfit. As complex as they seem from afar, when you zoom in, they're really just bold blobs of color. To make bolder adjustments to the painting, like adding a white highlight to the darker areas, you can always go back to the original palette. Make sure you spend some time on the highlights, these will really bring your portraits to life. I'm also taking care of the blur artifacts by strengthening transitions, like between the color and the jacket here. Now a quick pass on the background to remove most of its detail, and I think that we are done with the paintbrush process. Let's now artificially age our painting. I'll start with a subtle layer of grain to break up the digital aspect of our work. Next up, I will leave the black levels with a level adjustment and especially insist on the sides of the canvas far from the focus point. This will help blend the background and the clothes together, creating a sense of vignette. Our painting now needs a canvas texture. I'm using two, one that is cleaner and more repetitive, and the other one a bit grungier and more damaged. This is already making a massive difference. It also needs some oil cracks, with the centuries allowing the paint to age. I'm layering a bunch of different textures, some are dry soil cracks, some are flaking wall paints. Just make sure you use different variations, you break up the repetition and make them subtle. You don't want to hide the portrait too much. 
I'm introducing more aging artifacts with solid variations of colors and damage details. To make the aging of the canvas feel organic, you will need to spend some time here and examine references of old oil paintings. And with everything now merged together, I will make a final adjustment. Here's one last tip from Velasquez's workflow which we can incorporate. Contrast and saturation. Colors appear more saturated when they are surrounded by faded colors. A good example is in Las Meninas. This red really pops out because of the faded gray surrounding it, but the actual color itself is not particularly saturated. So in my case, I'm desaturating the background more than the face, which makes the character stand out more. And well, I think that's it. This project was extraordinarily fun to make. Researching about Velasquez's life, trying to understand his technique and approach, figuring out how to replicate his style in digital art. And we've got to experiment with some exciting new tools available for anyone. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love to hear your feedback in the comments. I might make another similar video, maybe on Caravaggio and Tenebrism. What do you think? Make sure you leave a like on the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on the next content. Also, check out my Instagram to see my art and my Patreon where you can access my project files. Alright, see you next time, the video is over.